Good evening and praise the Lord. My name is George Kahuongatia from PCA Sukai Parish. And uh, this uh, Thursday evening of the 9th of April 2020, I wish to talk about Jesus, the Passover lamb. Uh, starting on Sunday, we have been accompanying our Lord Jesus Christ on his journey to the cross, a journey of incomparable import to the Christian church individually and corporately because our salvation is hinged on the outcome of the journey. That is what our Lord Jesus Christ achieved for us through his death on the cross. The church celebrates the day as Mount Thursday, for it is the day that Christ instituted the Lord's Supper, and it was the night on which he was betrayed prior to his crucifixion. In the Jewish calendar, it was the day that they killed the Passover lamb, and we'll examine its significance to believers in Christ today. The first thing I wish to note is about the washing of the disciples' feet. The Apostle John records that when the disciples got together with the Lord that evening, as supper was in process, Jesus took off his outer garments and took a towel and a basin of water and began to wash his disciples' feet. Peter initially resists Christ's unprecedented action, but he eventually accepts it. In the book of John chapter 13, verse 2 to 15. The significance of the washing of the disciples' feet is that we need to meet the needs of each other in an attitude of humility, such as this time when many people are out of work due to the challenges arising from the coronavirus pandemic. We need to be available to minister to those who are in need, be it the sick, the hungry, the bereaved, among other emerging challenges, such as those cut off from their families because of the lockdown in Nairobi, Metropolis, Mombasa, and other areas, irrespective of their social status. When talking about Jesus as the Passover lamb, by far the most significant event that evening was the Passover meal that Christ shared with his disciples. It is important to note that that day was the beginning of the eight-day Jewish Passover that each Israelite was commanded to observe annually from the Mosaic law. In remembrance of the day the angel of the Lord passed over the house of the Israelites that were marked with the blood of a slain one-year lamb and instead killed the Lord, that angel instead killed the firstborn sons of the Egyptians whose houses were not marked with that blood, leading to the immediate release of the Israelites from their 430 year sojourn in Egypt in the book of Exodus chapter 12 verses 1 through 30. In the divine plan of God, the start of this year's Jewish Passover was Wednesday, that is yesterday, 8th April 2020, that is yesterday evening. And since the Jewish day is evening to evening, of the next day means that the Passover and the Christian Thursday of the Holy Week have tied in. Earlier that day, via the word of knowledge, Christ had sent his disciples to a specific individual to request that he avail a room where Christ would eat the Passover meal with the disciples. In preparation for this Passover meal, the disciples had to slay a one-year lamb for that evening meal. This is an example uh, to me of an individual who though unknown or mention, not mentioned by name in the Bible, he supported the ministry of Christ at a critical time in his ministry. That is the eve of his crucifixion. I know that we should be as ready to avail ourselves and resources for the ministry of Christ today. The other thing I'm noting is the institution of the Lord's Supper or the whole, what you call the Holy Communion today. As the Lord Jesus Christ and disciples were still at supper, Christ took some bread and he broke it, saying, take it, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He likewise took a cup after supper, saying, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Here, Jesus identifies himself as the Passover lamb 
that was as yet unknown to his disciples was to be crucified the following day. In doing so, Jesus identifies himself as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this is how John had introduced Christ to his disciples. That is in the book of John chapter 1, verse 35 to 242. The significance of this act of Christ is to offer himself up as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of those who would put their trust in his salvific act by voluntarily going to the cross. The other thing I'm noting on that very evening is that after supper, Christ informed his disciples that he was going away. This information troubled them. Where are you going? Why can't we follow you now? We are even ready to lay our lives down for you, such as Peter said. But Jesus encouraged them by telling them that he would not leave them like orphans, but he would leave them a helper, the Holy Spirit, who would teach them all things and remind them of the things that Christ had taught them. And he will, he will be there to, 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 to teach them, to empower them, and to guide them. As believers today, we have a helper in the person of the Holy Spirit who is there to empower us, to encourage us, and to enable us to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord our God. We should not be troubled. My friends, we have a helper to take us through these unsettling times of the coronavirus pandemic. The other issue I'm noting is that Christ promised his disciples peace. And he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let your heart be afraid. John chapter 14 verses 27. These words are ever fresh and applicable to us today. If there's a time that the church and the nation and the world at large needs peace, it is now. But the world gives peace through abundance of wealth, pleasure and security and position in society. That's what the kind of peace the world gives. The current scenario of the coronavirus a pandemic has scuttled all those things. Your wealth and position cannot save you. That is why Nations such as Italy, we are seeing many turning to the Lord in the streets crying out to the Lord. And they are realizing that the Lord Jesus Christ is the last resort or option for them. When medicine and the plans of man come a cropper, Jesus is a true source of unshakable peace. Put your trust and your hope in him today. His is a peace that surpasses all understanding. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. That is if Jesus Christ is in your soul, my friend, he will radiate his eternal peace that will permit through you and to the world around you, causing others to seek the peace giver in you. The other thing that Jesus spoke of to his disciples was a promise of victory over the world. Jesus told them, I'm promising you victory. However, was Jesus Christ promising them a trouble-free life or a trouble-free world? Nothing could be further from the truth. He in fact told them to expect hatred, persecution, rejection, and a scattering from the world. That's John chapter 15, verse 18 to 25. However, in him, they would have peace and encouragement because he had overcome the world. And these are his words. These things have I spoken to you, that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. How had Christ overcome the world? Firstly, he had lived a sinless life through his life on earth, making his coming sacrifice on the cross that on the day of Friday, that is tomorrow, acceptable before the Father. The lamb, according to Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, that was to be offered was supposed to be pure and without blemish. So Christ was saying, my sacrifice for the sin of mankind will be accepted by the Father because 
I have lived a pure life. Secondly, Christ had overcome the world by overcoming all the temptations and the snares set up for him by the kingdom of darkness or by Satan. In John chapter 14 verse 30, Jesus Christ said, For the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. There is, that is, there is nothing he can accuse me of that I did this or that in contravention of the law of my God for my own benefit. Thirdly, Jesus was preparing to deal a demolishing and a decisive blow to the kingdom of darkness, to the devil, through his death on the cross. The death of Christ was and is an enigma to the kingdom of darkness. What do I mean? Christ dying on the cross was a false victory to the kingdom of darkness. Satan had not contended or fathomed the power of the Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection or the power of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Christ's death broke the power of death over the saints, you and I who believe. Our Lord finished or extinguished its power. He went into death and imploded it from within by coming out alive forevermore. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 18, Jesus Christ says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. He also went into hell and preached to the souls that were some time back imprisoned by death and hell. First Peter chapter 3, verses 19. Therefore, those of us who believe in our Lord Jesus Christ do not fear death. For the one who overcame death lives inside of us. First John chapter 4 verse 4 says, You are of God, little children, and you have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That is a very, very important point, an encouraging point. Christ that evening also made a very impassioned prayer for his disciples and for those who would believe in him through the ministry of the disciples. And this prayer has several components that I would want to look at as I draw to a conclusion. Firstly, he prayed that the Father would keep through his name those whom he had given to Christ. Jesus prayed that you and I would be sustained and manifest the oneness present in the triune God. John chapter 17, verses 11 to 12. Secondly, Christ prayed that his joy may be fulfilled in us. How is this? His overcoming joy. He said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And remember, the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Thirdly, he prayed that the Father keeps us from the evil one. Hallelujah. The Father is more than able to keep us from the evil one. The power of our God and his might are incomparable to that of the enemy. Remember, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord that he is my refuge and my fortress. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall hide. Fourth day, he prayed that we may be sanctified by the Father's truth. His word is truth. His word is truth. And the Bible says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Fifthly, he prayed for us who would believe in Christ through the gospel preached by the disciples. So, Jesus saw you even before you came to Christ. He prayed for you. And we thank God here we are. And we glorify the Lord. The other, th the other point is that Jesus prayed with the desire that we may be with him where he is. And that we may behold the glory the Father had given to him. Amen. This means that Christ prayed that you and I will behold the glory that the Father had given to him before the foundation of of the world. Jesus sees the church in victory, standing before him and the Father at the end of this age. 
my, we can only say, Amen, Father. We surrender to you and manifest the victory of your dear son in us. Now, I want to say that this is the message the Lord had given to me this evening. That Jesus is our Passover lamb, my friends. And his sacrifice is enough for you and I. If you have put your faith and your trust in Jesus, this coronavirus, I believe by faith, will pass over us. It will not touch us. It will be extinguished by our Lord. And we pray that his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary may be sufficient even to atone for your sins and my sins and make us free from this pandemic. Let us pray. Father, we come before your presence this very evening. And we pray that may the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross become acceptable to you, O Father, for our sins. That are many as individuals. We have sinned against you as families, as the church, and as a nation. We now declare that Jesus, you are our Lord and Savior. And that you're the only way to the Father. We pray that you may forgive us our sins that have caused you to allow droughts, locusts, and the coronavirus to punish our land. Forgive us where we have also oppressed the poor and taken advantage of the vulnerable. In these 21 days of prayers and fasting that as a Sukari parish, Lord, we have been coming before your presence. And we also ask you that you may forgive, that, we, that as we also forgive those who have wronged us, that you may also forgive us our sins. In particular, we also want to forgive those who have hurt us through various actions and words. And we thank you, Father, that on the cross of Calvary, Jesus hung on the cross for us and he, be, he became a curse for us. Yes, Jesus became a curse for us. For it is written, cast is anyone who hangs on a tree. We now pray that you may release us from the curses that are upon our lives today as individuals and as a nation, even as families. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And by faith, we are praying that you may you may release us from the consequence of those curses and heal us as families and as a nation and individuals. We pray that, Lord, this coronavirus may come to an end through the, your power, through your sacrifice on the cross, that you may break its yoke over our lives. You may break its yoke of fear and yoke even of destruction and death. And Lord, you may heal our land. And when our land is healed and we are back in our various activities, we shall be careful to humble ourselves and glorify your name. We cast our cares unto you, Lord, because you surely care for us. Hear this our prayer. For we do pray it in faith, knowing that you have heard us. Through he who died and rose again for our sakes, the name of Jesus Christ, our only Lord and Savior.